Okay, welcome back. Um, we'll continue on with, uh, we were doing ethics, um, uh, ethics in counseling, and uh, we covered uh, I think five of them. We will move on to the next one, which we're looking at. We, we were looking at cultural regard, and just a couple more of points um, with, with regard to that uh, is, uh, Just a couple more points with regard to that, like like we were just just to talk about how um, uh, our knowledge of uh, our knowledge of other practices and worldviews, and uh, also our sensitivity and skills in order to uh, work with with different cultures or different um, different people of different faith or different attitudes is something that's important. So that knowledge is definitely uh, needed. Uh, it should also, um, you know, uh, our knowledge about, about people or cultural practices or worldviews that conflict with our Christian faith also is something that we need to be aware of in order for us to stand on with this practice of being able to, um, uh, to, to, be, to, to have that call towards working with, with others and the dignity that we keep even as we're dealing with people of other faiths. Okay, So what we need to uh, work with is to understand that a counselee's belief system, um, uh, whatever their belief system, we maintain that respect and strive also to understand their position or their value issues that may be important to them and uh, also foster values uh, that informed their decision making in, the, in that process. So um, like, like we said, we, we're careful not to impose our values, uh, not to impose our faith. Um, uh, you know, if, even we may, as, as a counselee, may be in a position or may be in a place to expose um, uh, counselees to our faith orientation, we do not impose our beliefs or practices on on the counselee, and that or on the counselee, and that's something that we need to take uh, extreme care to do. And that's what that's what we mean by saying, you know, having uh, a, a call to dignity, where they are determining for themselves what they would like. Okay, now this is specifically in view of us working with those of different religions, different faith. Okay, The next one is what we look at, a call to soundness, which is manage, managing uh, a case management. Now, what do we do here? What, what do we say? It is uh, uh, when we are meeting a person, an individual, we do see them as a byproduct of many other aspects or areas in their life. They, you know, if you look at them as a whole, they, there is, there's just not a body, there's just not a psychological experience, there's just not a spiritual experience, but there is, um, you know, they, they, they belong to a culture, they belong to, uh, to maybe a family, they belong to a larger community. There, is, there are multiple relationships that that uh, that keep them right or that influence them or that impact them so when we are working with people we are also looking at them not just as an individual but looking at them on a larger uh, um, framework or a larger orientation right where we are uh, including their holistic them as a whole person and that's what it, it requires for us to um, maybe coordinate. It also requires for us to have a plan in a way that brings about the best interest for the person you're dealing with in respect to uh, to their socio-cultural factors as well. Okay, So the plans or, the, or intervention or treatment plans are developed utilizing some principles. One is based on, of course, their own problem or the issue they come from. Uh, where you're also helping them to promote their own ownership. You're also incorporating other kind of assessments that you may have. Um, you're, you're identifying certain goals, certain objectives, uh, and ensuring that this also includes their, uh, their cultural or their holistic person, not just the problem that they're coming up with, but them as a holistic person. And that's where you need to be sensitive to other factors uh, where, where we help to treat our counselees 
with with uh, with their understanding or with their framework and continue to provide them the best of service by really looking at them as a whole so when we look at case management where what what the word actually means is just not one area of them but all areas is something that we are looking at and if you if you remember you know when we spoke about of understanding needs we spoke about seeing the person as a whole being they have a physical being they have an emotional being a rational being um, a spiritual being and a volitional being now all of this is what in brings them as a person and that's what we mean by saying case management is not just looking at it from a spiritual point of view or a psychological point of view or an emotional point of view but really bringing up everything together uh, together as a whole okay and the last one is community presence in christian counseling now as a counselor as christian counselors we need to be aware of the larger role that we play in the community uh, uh, at large or uh, in the society in general so as christian counselors we acknowledge that um, you know we live in a culture that probably does not share a common christian value base and therefore we are we need to be mindful to present ourselves as the salt and light or as or as the ambassadors of god and while we do that we conduct ourselves with dignity we conduct ourselves with humility avoiding any practice or um, any any behavior that brings dishonor to god or brings dishonor to the name of christ and that we will uphold every um, every value every principle that god gives us and you know we pray that we will we will adopt to this uh, to this code professionally and live it up on honorably to see that um, you know even as we maintain um, even as we are helping we maintain that sense of identity that the identity that we have in Christ as well as a sense of unity in into the faith so so being um, mindful about that even as we work at a larger community okay so this this is where um some of these code of ethics is what we incorporate even as we uh, build ourselves on practice the next part that i'm going into is something that's a little bit more practical it is to establish certain boundaries boundaries even as we work alongside with people and and this may be very practical uh, guidelines that we need to keep in mind uh, taking upon some of those ethical considerations that we've seen okay so what are boundaries boundaries are things that uh, that they're guidelines and they're based on certain principles and these code of ethics that we are uh, that we spoke about so it indicates a certain border or a certain limit and we operate within within certain boundaries so that we make our work uh, uh, relationships we we keep it professional we keep it safe and we we have certain limits for the services that we deliver now when we're looking at the concept um, of of boundaries um, we we need to have have some concepts in place okay one is a personal identity that needs to be um, a sense of personal identity which is constant over time which means we need to understand our roles and our responsibilities and where we are you know and who we are and what is it that we are standing for even as we are in a place of uh, uh, of working with others okay um we we um we look that you know as we grow in maturity in our faith uh, it it should percolate into our professional um into our professional spaces or into our ministerial spaces where this identity that we have uh, in Christ is constant regardless of whatever pressures that there may be or whatever up and down there may be we ensure that we we keep that identity going okay now there are certain contracts that we we uh, we build and that's that's why the, the concept of boundaries are important certain practical guidelines uh, that that we build through a contract now the, it is the contract what does the contract mean the contract is a place where um, there is a certain space which is safe for a counselor and a counselee's relationship to occur 
right? And so that can be maybe the time where you will meet, the time of contact, the date of contact, the place where you all will meet. You set limits to that, to the responsibilities of a counselor counseling, you know? It's not that because you're a counselor um, or, or someone um, who they're getting professional help from, you're there for general advice giving or general uh, you know situation so that's that's a certain boundary that that you you need to maintain otherwise those boundaries become extremely blurred okay um it's important that the counselor doesn't lose oneself in that relationship that is you avoid over involvement um and thereby you decrease the well-being of of uh, the counselee and you know it uh, it decreases your own well-being so you're providing a role model as you're building some of these boundaries. And when you set the boundaries and when you manage the boundaries, you're, 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 you're definitely bringing about a, a certain limit um, of how much your involvement, involvement needs to be. Okay, Because you being in a state or in a helping profession, uh, counselees may not understand that boundary. And it's important to draw that line um, between the self of the counselee and the self of the counsellor, even as you're working through some of these boundaries, okay? Uh, why is it necessary that we need to talk about these boundaries? It's one is to uh, recognize boundary issues as they arise. You know, like if, for example, maybe your counsellee keeps calling you beyond 9.30 in the night, right? Uh, maybe once or twice, depending on whatever the reason is, that's fine. But then as it keeps going on, you need to establish those those boundaries, like maybe emergency situations. So something that I say is you you are, you can get in touch with me either through email or through WhatsApp um, during these specific times. But in an emergency situation, please feel free to message me. Right. But then if you do see that, you know, it's going on beyond that specific guideline, that's something that you need to build that. Okay. You you're also clarifying your ethical expectations that there is there is some kind of limits that you're placing. You you need to talk about the boundaries so that you as a counselor yourself have a clear idea where your boundaries are or even have a plan of action if at any point of time there is any unprofessionalism or something that is unsafe that creeps in to this place of uh, of counseling. Okay. Um, Next, uh, yeah, it also reduces the risk of counseling exploitation. When you are placing your boundaries, you're also um, maintaining a certain uh, counseling counselor relationship where, where you know that you cannot step beyond a certain certain line or certain limit. Okay, um, it reduces the anxiety of uh, counseling. Um, as, as a lot of things are clear over there, especially when it comes to confidentiality, a lot of things are clear that, you know, nothing will be breached. It increases the well-being of the counselor as well as it provides a role model for counselees to be able to establish some of those boundaries. Okay. Now, who negotiates these boundaries? Who are the ones, uh, who is the person that actually brings up or talks about these boundaries? It's the duty of the counselor to bring it up in the best interest of the counselee. So the counsellor is the one who should be responsible in managing and maintaining these boundary in, uh, issues. And for that, as a counsellor, you need to be very clear about what your boundaries are and be able to articulate it as well to, to your counsellee. Okay. Um, next is, yeah, um, there are certain clear boundary areas that we need to be extremely uh, clear about. Now, I do understand when it comes with pastoral ministry, um, uh, yeah, there are some that, that are absolutely not negotiable, but there are some uh, that, that may be blurred, like for, like for the first one, you know, social activities. Maybe you're in a church setting um, and a lot of people who you're meeting as your counselees may be in the same uh, you know, same worship place as you are. And we, we do see that, and yeah, some of them can be exceptions. However, we're, we're talking about this in extreme professional spaces. Now, uh, for example, for uh, for me as a counselor, I do meet a lot of my counselees at church. We sit together at worship, but th there again, there needs to be a strong 
uh, boundary that I place in my head that even though this is there is a social activity that's going on, maybe it's a worship service that's going on, I'm careful not to bring up uh, issues that we've spoken in a counseling room, maybe in the presence of three, four people, or maybe in the presence of a worship uh, place. So that's something that the counselor needs to be extremely uh, clear and um, um, sure about. Okay. Um, other boundaries is yes, uh, there are clear boundary areas. Not having any intimacy, intimate relationships with those with other counselees. Having family members or friends as counselees is something that again you do not engage in because of the kind of emotional uh, connection you have with them. The 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 ability to be objective in that space may be diminished. And that's why you wouldn't uh, uh, address closer friends or you wouldn't address uh, close relatives, like maybe a lover or a relative, employee, employer, instructor, a business partner, or a friend. You know, you keep away uh, some of those, um, those uh, counseling some of these people who are there in your life, OK? Uh, areas where where boundaries may blur, uh, and and this is this is something that you know it's important for us to understand. Now, some of these boundaries, like we said, are not really clear cut or maybe not really defined, and these can be professional uh, potential areas of problems that we need to pay close attention. Like I said, like self disclosure, how much would you disclose to to someone who you know? Uh, maybe who is in your ch same church or someone who you're really helping, how much would you disclose, okay? Um, next one is giving or receiving significant gifts or uh, overlapping relationships. Maybe this is someone you knew uh, earlier, mm. you know, maybe as an acquaintance or as a, as, a, as a person who is probably a member of the church and then they become a counselee. And that's why we said, you know, there could be blurring of this. Or later, a counselee becomes a friend of yours, okay? And there again, then, uh, you know, it's important to re-establish uh, your counselling relationship or physical contact. Maybe it's it's a person that, like I said, you know, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a church member who is, um, who is a person who's coming to you for, for counselling. But then when you meet them in church, maybe you will have a handshake or you may give them a hug. And... So, the, so we need to recognize that that we need to be careful about how we respond to this because they are that there may not be, um, you know, complete right wrong answers to this. Okay, what are certain boundaries or danger zones that we look at is when the counselor over identifies with the counselee's issues. You know, when there is too much of an involvement or uh, it's preoccupying uh, your mind as a counselor you know, continues to preoccupy your mind that, you know, that you need to get them the best help or you're making the calls or you're making additional, uh, um, you know, e extra support and help to them. That's when you would know that you're maybe identifying uh, with, with their issues. Or there's a strong attraction to the counselee's personality. Or you spend time with the counselee outside <clears throat> of your work or work area. There again, it becomes a, becomes an uh, issue. Sharing too much of a personal information with the counselee again uh, becomes a uh, becomes an additional problem because there again there's a lot of lines that get that get blurred. And uh, this is something that I spoke about is transference and counter transference. So transference is when um, uh, there is a redirection of feelings about a specific person that the maybe your counselee is talking about onto someone else and this is usually the the counselor so they are redirecting their feelings about what they feel about someone towards the counselor okay and that this becomes like a red flag it's a danger zone because then there isn't again there is an objectivity and counter transference is the redirection of a counselor's feelings towards the counselee Okay, and both these areas is somewhere that maybe a, a counselor needs to identify and move away from being uh, in in that helping relationship. Move away and referring somebody to to somebody outside. That that becomes an important um, issue there. Okay, um, certain do's and don'ts when we're looking at uh, boundaries is to be careful not to. That, so there are certain 
certain nocturnes, okay? Not using um, uh, gestures, tone of voice, expressions, or any other behavior that a counselor could interpret as being demeaning or abusive, either sexually or otherwise. Because this is something we need to respect culturally, right? Because we may not um, understand, um, especially when if we are in a place where we have different cultures, what we may be doing, like maybe sitting too close or um, you know holding a person's um, uh, hand, all of that could be culturally very offensive in some cultures. So being extremely careful on how you um, display any form of a gesture, voice, expression. Uh, not making comments about a counselee's body or clothing, uh, that's an absolute no-no. Not engaging in inappropriate affectionate behavior with a counselee, again, that is something that is a no-no. Again, others, uh, not talking about your personal sexual preference or problems or fantasies, not requesting a date with a counselee, um, ensuring that whatever personal psychological needs um, that maybe a counselor has, that you meet it in other areas of your life, right? Uh, and, and, and not bring it on to the counselee, thereby bringing further damage. And it's important to maintain supervision or consultation relationships. It's always good um, to have a supervisor or someone to discuss some of the cases with or the the counseling issues with so that you get the best the, the counseling gets the best kind of help through that okay um, what do you do when you have a, a, a dual relationship what is the role of, of a du dual uh, relationship um, so so basically uh, you know something that that you need to consider what is dual relationship is what happens is that you're you're, you're not just a counselor but you're probably having another role with a counselee, right? Maybe it's like a church member. Now, some of these relationships can blur those boundaries. Now, these blurring of uh, boundaries often increases the risk of exploitation because sometimes the role becomes very, very confused, right? So these dual relationships uh, can involve the, the breakdown of proper professional or ministerial boundaries. So it exists when there are uh, two or more roles are mixed in a manner that could probably harm the counseling relationship or the process of counseling. So this includes counseling as well as personal or business or financial or romantic relationships. So not uh, so we need to understand that not all dual relationships are unethical. It is it is the counseling exploitation that is wrong, not the dual relationship of itself. So it remains, like I said, the responsibility of the counselor to monitor and evaluate any potential harm to the counselee. So that's why uh, it needs to be taken care of um, very, very seriously. Yeah. Um, and I think this is, uh, you know, when, when we're looking at these du dual relationships, sometimes uh, these dual relationships are unavoidable, unavoidable. Like, for example, you and your counselees belong to the same church or a counselee lives in your neighborhood, or um, maybe uh, you know they're working as a staff in your own organization, right? Uh, or uh, your counselee um, you know, becomes like an employee in the same place that you're working. Now, how do you deal with these unavoidable dual relationships? Is one, open and honest discussion with the counselee on the nature of your relationships. And something, uh, uh, you know, something that I remember that happened is um, there was a counselee who had come to me and was holding a very high position in a certain organisation. Now, it so happened that I have a friend in that organisation. So once when I went to meet the person, this, this my counselee was sitting right in front, uh, you know, in the next table. And uh, what I did, I mean, um, I had to, I, I didn't acknowledge the person because this friend of mine knows that I'm a counselor. I didn't acknowledge the person at all. But at the end of it, when he finished his coffee, he came up to me and he said a hello to me and I just had a casual conversation. Later, I sent him a message saying, um, you know, because I, I wanted to be careful that I didn't express my uh, knowledge of you because I didn't want to put you at a difficult spot. And then, you know, there was a perfect understanding. He said, you know, I perfectly understand. I thank you that you were cognizant of that. So that open discussion with counselee on the nature 
of that relationship is very important. Um, uh, be aware of threats to confidentiality. So that's why you need to be careful, because there may be certain times counselees may see you at a social setting. They may not want to acknowledge you. And, and you need to understand that that's fine. Is because you need to understand your role as, as a professional to them. So participating in that, in that, how you participate will really determine the outcome of it. OK? Um, now, now just, just like a side note, and I think this is important to, uh, to understand, is um, uh, how uh, you know these rules of ethics codes, uh, how, what is the application of it? What is the exemption of it? Now, pastors and unlicensed pastoral counselors, by regulation um, and by law, now this is in, in an American standard, they're not typically required to hold to the same standard of professional conduct as other practitioners. Okay, But you definitely do recognize here that you have a moral and an ethical imperative to uh, that you know that still exists as part of you being a Christian, that ethical boundary that still exists. So maybe not all of this may apply to each one of us, but nevertheless, there is there is a sense of um, uh, uh, imperative or an or an ethical need or a moral need that we have to ensure um, uh, you know as part of our faith that we do do not do anything that will cause a sense yeah. of um, um, uh, decline or 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 anything that will breach the your counselee's uh, um, information or anything that will bring down their trust and uh, trust towards you okay so here it is that you know i've kind of presented the the these considerations and these ethical boundaries now i'm open to any kind of questions you may have um, and i think we have around 20 minutes um, if, if you don't have any questions i'd be glad to respond to that Any questions? OK. So I suppose that is an ending. So just uh, maybe I think I just want to spend maybe 10 minutes, uh, and then we could probably close our call. Uh, the first thing is just uh, for, a, for, a, um, for those of you who have not finished your assessment, please kindly do it by tomorrow. After tomorrow, there wouldn't be a correction. So please ensure that you finish it. I hope all of you are able to access it. Some of you, I think there are seven or eight of you who've done it. Um, that's great. But if there's anyone else who needs to complete the assessment, please do that. Because without those marks, um, you, you will not get a, your, your final marks to not go up. So please ensure that you finish that. OK, that's fine. Secondly, I just would like to, um, one, um, just to probably now, maybe there are eight of us here. I think on this call, if there are, if there is, a, if there is a, a, anything that that really caught your attention through this course, that's one. And any feedback, I, I really would like any kind of a feedback that y'all could give me. Um, uh, and you know, please make it constructive. Negative feedback is great because you know can build on either in the content or the delivery or in whatever there is. If you all can provide a feedback, that would be really helpful for students coming after this to really enhance the course, whether it's the content um, in whatever way possible to ensure that I can uh, we can build on the content, build on the delivery of this. So two things. One is um, uh, just a word of how this has helped you, or if it hasn't helped you, that also is great. And secondly, any kind of feedback. Right, success, I see that you've uh, raised your hand. Would you like to ask a question? Yes, it's a question. Good morning, yes. everyone. Good morning, ma'am. Uh, an incident happened uh, here in Nigeria. A very notable pastor, when the chorister were ministering, and he collected the mic, and uh, in the pop, in the as service was going on and he said if you don't want to sing get out of the altar if you don't want to come early to church get out of the altar in such a way what kind of counseling can we give to those members who came for counseling uh so success i i heard you saying that uh, a pastor said 
if yes. you cannot sing, get up of your chair. Is that what he said? Yes. yes. Why the ministration was actually going on? It's a service period, service time. Okay. So, uh, and uh, coming out and pick up a mic, and uh, in presence of all the congregations, telling the chorister, if you don't want to sing, you get out of the altar. If you don't want to, if you come late to church, you 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 stop coming to the church. And and uh, I, I was wondering because we are not brought up in that way. So what kind of counsel? Because one of the members actually came and said, "This is what the pastor did." But I'm just very very careful because this is a ministry of a thing. And uh, mm -hmm. actually, I watched the video because uh, it's everywhere. So mm -hmm. what kind of counsel yeah. can somebody give to such members who came to? seek for counseling okay but i do understand success that they were at a church service and not in counseling isn't it no yes it's a church service it happened but after okay. the church service, he not, he, one of them came to me and said this is what happened what can i be okay. able to counsel be, be how, how, could yes. how could you help them how could you help them okay okay now i get that i think what you're saying is that this these are church members and the pastor yeah. was uh, was quite brash or very strong on uh, yeah. you know if they if they were not following certain things they were asked to leave the church and they were yeah. they were upset okay okay now i got that all right so i think in, in a in a situation like this uh, it's important to um, you know especially the members have come to you one is yes to hear them out to really hear their pain point i'm sure it has upset them. It's it's discouraged them that yes. maybe a pastor has treated or has spoken like this um, quite outrightly, um, and for for maybe certain things like coming late or if they're not singing, um, that that could probably seem you know quite minor, uh, and uh, as as a result of which is why maybe they're hurt. So I think one of the good thing is to just hear them out, just to bring them to a place of calm. What we should be careful not to do is not to uh, justify or um, uh, what do you say? It, it's not to either justify or con condemn the actions of the pastor. That's not what we are there to do. Our uh, our uh, our idea is to help the person whatever they are going through to really be able to share uh, to come to a place of um, you know understanding uh, what that meant to them and how they would like to move forward without any form of anger or resentment or hatred towards the pastor right so that's what something we should be careful about doing not to justify the action of the pastor or neither to um, condemn the action we, we we stand as a neutral party even as we are talking so that's with the counseling maybe with the pastor if you do have um, you know some form of access it may be good to give a feedback without disclosing the name of the members who came to you that uh, you know that that such and such people came to me for help because they were hurt maybe as an observer um, you know mentioning that probably some of the actions or some of the things that you observed at a church service maybe we we may need to relook at our um, our response to someone who comes late to service our response to those who are not singing in service or who are not standing up in service whatever it may be that we may need to look at carefully of our response of how we we react to some of these observations without really giving or disclosing the names of those who've come to you i think that may be that may help a little bit but uh, this may not be a counseling uh, uh, scenario. Nevertheless, with the with the members of your of your church, I think it's just hearing them out, um, helping them to really discern and understand how they would like to respond without your involvement of either justifying or condemning the actions of the pastor. I hope that helped. Success. Okay. All right. Okay, so um, I hope that that uh, helped. So, Ken, Ken, I think there are seven of us on the call. Just quickly, 
you know, in a minute or two, if you are one, is uh, any kind of um, uh, how this course has either helped you, not helped you, and any kind of a, a, a feedback that you would have would be really helpful. Yes, please. We have just 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes. We could try and complete through that. Yes, uh, Lubega, please go ahead. Before this course, thank, thank you, Pastor. Before this course, I thought I knew a bit of counseling, but uh, I, I, I saw that I really needed to go back to baby class. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm so glad that uh, you were able to see a lot more. Praise God. Praise God for that. Yeah. Uh, yes, Divya. Thank you, ma'am. Am I audible? Yes, you are. You are. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you so much. The course was so useful. It was a great eye opener, actually, especially even if I'm not doing any professional counseling, but even if, uh, you know, interacting with people, uh, even in the family, right, with the children, with our own spouses, uh, uh, it has taught me a lot. Uh, and I, I, I wish it were, there, were more, there was more time, uh, you know, to uh, really go in depth. But Really thankful for the course, and uh, it was uh, amazing. Thank you for making it so interesting. I know it could be sometimes, uh, you know, point after point, but you made it so interesting with all the case studies, and uh, really appreciate, man. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Any feedback? I'm looking also for as much feedback as possible. Yes, success. Go ahead. Um, thank you, and thank you, I thank you. <laughs> uh, this talk is so awesome and so helpful. I must tell you, uh, uh, all my books, all my uh, my course materials, I utilize them everywhere, and I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful to having you as my lecturer. And uh, there is no cause to leave behind to leave behind in the APC. And by the next session, I'm going to recommend a lot of my church members to join. Thank oh, you. Oh, so lovely. Much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, success. Thank you. All right. Anybody else? Anyone else? Um, thank you so much, Pastor, for this time of learning. And it's been uh, personally for me, um, it's been really a blessing because I get to interact with a lot of people, especially young people. And uh, and also there are a lot of uh, elderly uh, people as well. So uh, it really helped me understand where do I stand, where do, how do we put in the uh, the word, especially uh, I really enjoyed the session where we spoke about the body language and um, uh, the, the thing that we personally need to be aware of while talking to others, the language, non-verbal non communication and all that stuff. Really enjoyed that part because I think it it really helped me as a person to connect with people and also to um, uh, under try and understand. Um, and also, I, I think throughout this course, um, uh, I became a little more aware of myself. Where is, where is my shortcoming? And uh, try and understand how I can be a better person in talking to others, um, especially uh, the temperament that uh, um, we personally hold and. And uh, when we interact with people, we begin to understand where they are coming from, not uh, from, uh, you know, a, a judgmental way. And it's it's been a wonderful journey for me personally. And thank you so much for that. Um, the case studies have been really, uh, really interesting and it makes a lot to think, <laughs> which is uh, which is really helpful. Um, so maybe uh, we could, uh, I think I think it's on um, the, the number are, on point now the case studies that we have but in case if you would like to increase a few more case studies uh, that would be uh, really helpful sure. that, that's great thank you thank, thank you, you so much pastor john thank you anybody else okay great okay thank you so much i just uh, would like to really add um, thank you so much for being a wonderful lot uh, you'll have been a quiet lot, but nevertheless, I think uh, th there have been definite points of time that uh, each of you all have given, uh, you know, made me really think 
um, thank you so much because I think I, I really enjoy that. Uh, it, it expands my understanding. Uh, it expands me needing to really look into details. So thank you so much um, for I really, uh, I, I, I haven't seen many of you in person, but uh, I just pray that you know, at some point of time, God brings that, um, you know, that we could meet each other in person and uh, just exchange a prayer. So thank you so much. Bless uh, all of you in, in your, if some of you are going into your, into your next year, pray that uh, God really uses you and your ministry. Can we just close with a word of prayer? Before that, I also want to thank all those e-learning students. Thank you so much for your feedback, for engaging with uh, with me through your discussion points. Um, some of you have really, uh, you know, week after week, I do see how much you're invested in learning and uh, a prayer for all of you and uh, rich blessings to each one of you, wherever you are in your ministry and your families. God bless each of you. Let me just close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just uh, see how faithful you have been to us through these past months as we've uh, tried to unpack this uh, this very important ministry. God, even as all of us are, Lord, a little bit better in knowing and understanding, Father, none of this makes sense without the power of the Holy Spirit over us, Lord, giving us discerning eyes and hearts and minds to really see deeper into the needs of people. Father, we pray, God, that you will uh, bless each one of us. You will give us those spiritual gifts of uh, wisdom and knowledge as we talk and as we share. Give us your heart, God, as we interact with, uh, with uh, our families, with people, our friends, those who are members of our church, maybe even counselors at a more greater professional level. Father, we just we need your grace and your mercy, your love, your compassion, Lord, yet, Father, to be firm and to be um, to be instructional in the places that you have called us to be. Father, uh, Lord, enhance our knowledge, enhance our skill, enhance our ability. Most of all, Holy Spirit, we pray that our focus and our eyes are on you, even as we minister, that we will hear from you, we will know from you, God, what are the right things to say, what not to say. Thank you, God. Lord, I pray for each student here, all my students and uh, on the e-learning portal, Father, each of them, I place them to your throne of grace, wherever they are at, as in whatever they do, God, that you will expand, God, their areas of influence and their area of impact, Father, make them, Lord, real ambassadors for you. Thank you once again. We ask, God, that your presence and your power be over us. In Jesus' precious name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you all so much. God bless. And uh, we shall meet at some point of time. Uh, Divya, may I just request you to stay back uh, while, while the rest of us speak in business. Thank you. Uh, okay. Thank you.